Welcome to this episode of I Was There Too. We love having great advertisers support our show. But in order to continue doing that, we need your help. So please go to podsurvey.com slash IWTT and take a quick anonymous survey that will help us get to know you a little better. That way we can match up advertisers with your interests and I won't have to read something about sports. Even if you've taken our show's podcast listener survey before, the current one is new and different. Plus, once you've completed the survey, you can enter to win a $100 Amazon gift card. That's podsurvey.com slash IWTT. Hello and welcome to this episode of I Was There Too. My name is Matt Gorley. This is the show where I talk to people who were there in the great scenes of cinema history. Today, a little hodgepodge episode. We get to talk more Back to the Future with Jeffrey Wiseman, who played George McFly after Crispin Glover infamously bowed out of the role. Or was forced out? Nobody really seems to know. But I found it interesting to talk to Jeffrey, who has the unique perspective of playing a character that's already been previously established, but also has to almost seem like it's the same actor playing it. Many actors have stepped into roles played by previous actors, but this one seems curious and different in that they almost tried to pass it off as if Crispin Glover never left. In fact, Crispin Glover sued the production because of that very reason, that it made it seem like he was in the film and using his likeness. After that, we'll talk to Ben Acker and Ben Blacker about what it's like to work with the Lucasfilm Story Group in their experience in writing a Star Wars novel, one that does me personally a great favor having to do with being part of the Star Wars canon. Very, very exciting. Let's just get right into it. Thank you for listening and enjoy. The films, Back to the Futures 2 and 3, the years 1989 and 90, the role, George McFly. The actor, Jeffrey Wiseman. Jeffrey Wiseman, how did you approach playing a previously established character in the sequels to Back to the Future? Like, as an actor, and in the interest of bringing something of your own to the character, I'm curious what you found the ratio of impersonation versus acting to be for this role. Uh, well, Matt, that's a very good question. It, it It's basically a mix of both acting and impression as you say, because the the uh, groundwork had been laid. You know, Crispin is so unique in his uh, talent and performance and his timing and all. And I, I when I first worked with him at a on a film at AFI, uh, the year before he got the first Back to the Future film, I thought he was just remarkable, very uh, singular talent. And so I was compelled to try to stay in touch with him. And, and when the first Back to the Future film came out, I said, my God, this guy's knocking it out of the park. He's great. And then when the opportunity arose for me to uh, be his photo double for part two, uh, I was thrilled. You know, I, I wanted to work with him. I even called him and said, hey, say a good word for me. Uh, you know, I, I could use the work. And when I found out that he was not any longer part of the project and that I'd be taking over the role, I was shocked. I was like, how am I going to fill these big shoes? There's no way they can do this without him. And uh, originally I thought, oh, they probably need George in two places at the same time. And I'm going to double him over here while he's over there, you know, like, like Kevin did for Michael J. Fox. And when it turned out that I was, you know, playing the role, they gave me Crispin's screen tests. And I studied, of course, the films extensively uh, to get the physicalization and the vocalization and all the mannerisms. Um, and to answer the question, doing an impression basically of his George. But then I was able to advance on it a little bit, somewhat, uh, when we went to 2015, the McFly household of the future. And so, but I tried to, you know, keep respect and, and honor Crispin's work by keeping you know, the the vocalization type stuff that he laid down and gestures, you know, ah, ah, you know, the, the iconic laugh. In fact, that's 
you don't see it too much in the final cut, but in the uh, outtakes or bonus material, I, there is some, like in the scene pizza, if you get to see that, I, I do a, definitely a Crispin laugh. And and the gestures with the hands and holding the hair back and all, all that stuff that he really, he did his viewpoints work. If you're familiar with the acting term of viewpoints, his pacing and his physicalization, his relationship with hair and, and costumes, it's all uh, really quite wonderful. Because he's such a specific actor and, and one of a kind, does that make it more difficult because you have to feel like you have to get closer to the mark or in a way easier because there's specifics that you can reach for when trying to do a similar portrayal? You, you kind of answered it. It's both. <laughs> it's, it's great to have the example of the original, the work, and if it is singularly eccentric, as in his case, it's much easier to zone in on that and then re repeat and, and get it down. Whereas if it's a more vague or not, not so specific, uh, it may be harder to nail. But then again, when you get to advance on it, you get to maybe even take what they have a, a, a small amount of and turn the volume up on that and try to go further with it. As in the case of the Back to the Future movies, I wasn't necessarily invited to table reads and rehearsals that much. So I wasn't given the opportunity to really advance that much. Uh, there, there were a couple things. example, in the 2015 stuff, the, the, when we went back to uh, 55 and chasing the almanac and all that, I basically was repeating the fight with Biff and kissing Lorraine on the dance floor. All that stuff it was already laid down, and we were, just had to recreate it from different angles. And then in 2015, when we got to the future, the McFly household, I was able to advance a little bit. I had a little time. As you know, I was hung upside down from out, outdoors, outside of the front door, all the way through the kitchen. So hanging upside down for a couple of weeks was lots of fun. <laughs> uh, but uh, one of the first things I remember uh, while I'm hanging at the front door is my head was hanging about butt level with Michael J. Fox's Marlene, and they had put him in the hot pants, orange hot pants, and patted them out to give him a butt, give her a butt. And I thought, oh, my God, it looks like they gave him a pumpkin butt. And I was able to improvise and come up with that line, how's granddad's little pumpkin? <laughs> also got to eat a banana upside down. <laughs> was the choice to have George McFly hanging upside down so much an attempt to obscure his face or for more sinister reasons having to do with Crispin Glover originally being in this role or going to come back in the role? Well, it's apparent that you've done your homework. Uh, I think it's both um, because both have been uh, talked about that. Uh, yes, the thought was, you know, we'll, we'll uh, I, you know, I think maybe it was the torture thing more than the to obscure because I believe that he was hung upside down in the script before I came on the pr Paradox project. It was originally called Paradox. It was part two and three in the same script. And I, I think because a, a crew member actually came over and said, you know, I think all this torture was meant for Crispin, um, you know, was told to me. And I was like, yeah, OK, that makes sense. <laughs> uh, Crispin really pushed a lot of people's buttons on the first film. And, and uh, to be blatant, you know, Bob Gale and Spielberg and company did not get along with the fellow. And uh, I think it was payback, <laughs> which I got to endure. So. Yeah, wow. It's not fair. When you called Glover and asked him to put in good word for you as the photo double, did he know at the time that you were potentially replacing him, do you think? I really couldn't say. I, all I did innocently, because I had his number, was try to get him to uh, give me a character reference or you know, a recommendation, this guy's good, because... We had worked together on a film. I thought maybe he remembered me and, and would help me out since since my wife at the time was expecting our second child and I needed my medical coverage. Uh, but I did not hear back from him, and I did end up getting the part and got my medical coverage, so uh, that kind of worked out. Win-win. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, he tracked me down. Ironically, I was doing an event for Universal in Boston, and somehow he – tracked me down in Boston. I'm st it's still a mystery to me how he found me at that hotel um, to uh, tell his sob story of how they used his uh, likeness or actually footage of him without paying him what he thought he was worth and 
uh, how they abused him on the first film and, and would, would I be, uh, open to helping him in his case, which, you know, he had a very compelling argument. Why, you know, you're going to use an actor's face and, and footage without really letting him negotiate. I mean, that's, it's just not fair. And uh, so, uh, that's, he, he didn't really contact me until he was ready to sue. And what did he say when, when he did contact you? Oh, he he just told the stories of how they abused him on the first film. And, and you know, I I could see his story. I'd heard the stories about uh, how he was abusive to others on the first film uh, on the other side. So it was really odd being caught in the middle of this whole thing. And it was kind of odd since he he didn't necessarily win his case, but he had enough going for him that he probably would have won. So they settled out of court for three quarters of a million dollars. And I thought, well, you know, I, I help, probably helped him a great deal here. At least he could do his, his call and thank me, which he never did. <laughs> <laughs> so how were you greeted by the cast and crew as not only the new guy, but the guy replacing the old guy? Uh, at first it was very awkward. Really? I, I don't know that the even the makeup people were all that comfortable. You know, uh, some great, great makeup legends worked on that show from Kenny Myers and Marvin Westmore to Mike Mills and Nancy Vasta and Zoltan and his wife, people who won Academy Awards and, not, and all. And they were lovely to work with. There wasn't uh, necessarily any animosity, but I know that uh, Ken Chase, the original designer who got fired um, – because of being ornery, uh, had, uh, I think, mixed mixed feelings. And and when I'd go onto the set, one the first time, in fact, seeing Michael, in, and when I was in the young George makeup, age 17, it, th- first thing out of his mouth was, oh, Crispin ain't going to like this, you know. Oh, and and I had to screen test, you know, and, and Zemeckis turned to Dean Cundy, the great cinematographer from Jurassic Park and, uh, Halloween movies and all. And he says, Dean, what do you think? And, and Dean just blatantly said, I think we got Crispin without the trouble. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so I knew I was in a weird place there. It was, it was very odd, you know, and I kind of felt like, Oh my God, am I a scab here? What, what is going on? But ultimately, you know, they had a job they needed to do. Everyone who was being paid millions of dollars, except me. And, uh, and they had to uh, continue this story of these wonderful films and make these films and couldn't be uh, derailed by, uh, you know, the, the demands of Mr. Glover. Though, you know, at the time Crispin was up and coming, I loved his work in River's Edge and his other film appearances. And I imagined he just had other commitments and or, you know, thought he was worth the the a hundred thousand or a million, whatever he was holding out for. Uh, but, uh, Spielberg and, and Zemeckis did not. So, or Bob Gale and company. Um, so, you know, they, they were in a, between a rock and a hard place and I needed the work. So the equation kind of worked out for me. If it wasn't me, it would, would have been another actor and probably the same type of story going on with the suit. But what a unique experience for you. I'm trying to think of another circumstance in film history. There certainly have been actors that have replaced other actors in the same role, James Bond or Dumbledore and Harry Potter, but never this infamously that I can think of. And to not only replace them, but to actually try to physically represent them with full prosthetics and makeup and almost make it the audience at least believe it's the same actor playing that role. Is there another example of that you can think of? Well, uh, with the coming of the digital age, you see it now, example, the, the end of uh, Rogue One oh, there yeah, with yeah. Carrie Fisher. Now, now was that archive footage or was that Carrie Fisher and they just made her look younger? Do, do we know? Yeah, it <laughs> you know, was a complete CG recreation with another actress as the body, but a completely CG'd face. Okay, so... Did Carrie Fisher give her uh, uh, permission for that? Apparently she did, and same with Peter Cushing, whose character was recreated even in in greater length. Apparently his estate gave permission for that as well. Okay, so so it is being done now even on a more advanced level. Instead of having to be in makeup for the application of the prosthetic makeup for four hours, you know, so they (laughs) advanced on what I was involved in there. You know, I have mixed feelings about it. I think 
yes, it's great. Continue the story, do whatever it takes, uh, but don't do it without the original actor's approval. You know, give them a piece of this blockbuster. You know, I, I look back and, you know, I see those <laughs> Back to the Future films have probably made a billion dollars maybe a couple times. And here I, I'm kind of still a starving actor and even was shortly after making the films. It, it really w- was uneven. You certainly have done your fair share of impressive roles here. Let's talk about a few of them. First of all, Clint Eastwood's Pale Rider, his return to the kind of that – great anti-hero Western that he made famous in many ways. Tell us a little bit about your role in that. You know, I spoke with a writer while we were shooting on that, and he had been trying to get Clint to do that script for like 10 years. Oh, so even back in the day when he was kind of originally doing them, huh? Yeah, well, he, uh, I guess, was so happy, you know, doing fine, doing Dirty Harry movies. Uh, He didn't necessarily want to get back in the saddle. And he had success with the outlaw Josie Wales and, and had, I guess, enough money thrown at him by Warner Brothers. And I, I believe Warner Brothers bought him a new bus for directing. Uh, you know, so uh, so he returned to it. And, and it was kind of cool. I, I, I didn't agree with uh, at the time. I remember saying, oh, I don't like violence in movies so much. Should I do this film? And I was like, what are you saying, Jeffrey? You've, you're co-starring with Clint. You've got to be kidding. So, I, you know. <laughs> Then looked more at the metaphor of the film. You know, Clint, it's not spelled out well uh, in the film. But if you look when he takes his shirt off inside uh, Carrie Snodgrass's character's little hut there, he's got scars of bullet wounds all around his heart. And he appears in the film out of nowhere in the snowstorm. So he's a ghost and the pale rider, pale ghost and pale horse. And, uh, that was kind of cool because he had been the ghost in High Plains Drifter and then there was the Shane element. So it was very much a tribute to Westerns and it was great to see him do a tribute. And then him coming back full bore in his next film, the Western, The Unforgiven, which he got the Academy Award for. It was It was really thrilling to see Clint do that. Johnny Dangerously. Oh, yeah. Uh <laughs> Amy Heckerling wanted a, a New York accent, and I, you know, I raised in, in L.A. and and I did have a, a step grandfather from Brooklyn, so I, you know, I, uh, so I would do my New York accent, East Toit and Toit, you know, as best I could, and she just didn't buy it. She didn't <laughs> like, she didn't like it, but she was out down to the wire and she says, "All right, just just do your best and do this." And she gave me the uh, I Heart Johnny T-shirts to sell, the T-shirt vendor in the scene with Dom DeLuise as the Pope and, you know, the big crowd scene. It was so silly, uh, but it was so cool to be on that set working with that up-and-comer Michael Keaton and, and of course, Joe Piscopo and Mary Lou Henner and, and uh, uh, Maureen Stapleton, who I adored. Uh, so it was, it was very cool to be on that. And uh, ironically, you know, being a starving actor, I, I did uh, catering to stay alive. And uh, the catering company I worked for worked the rap party. <laughs> and and I'm serving drinks to Michael Keaton and Amy Heckerling. And Michael leans over to Amy and says, it wasn't, isn't he in the film? It was nice to be recognized by Michael. Uh, <laughs> well, you made it to the party one way or the other. That's right. Just lucky, I guess. <laughs> Let's talk about Twilight Zone, the movie. Yeah, well, um, I was a, a very big fan of uh, the Mad Max movies. Road Warrior had come out and uh, George Miller was hot, hot Australian director. And uh, I got the call to audition for that film. And I was like, how? They can't do that. What? I thought the film was dead in the water after the accident on the John Landis set. And uh, my agent said, well, Spielberg decided since they got most of that segment in the can that he wanted to finish the film, which you know, a lot of people thought was in bad taste, but I needed to work. I wanted to work. And I went in and auditioned and my audition was to tell a joke. And it was, I think his first time in Hollywood and he was kind of taken by it all. And so was I, not that I was my first time, but I just got along with him really great from the go get. And it was really wonderful because of course I knew the original episode with William Shatner (laughs) 
<laughs> you know, it was like, okay, it's almost scary, this guy on the wing uh, on that <laughs> version. But when you saw Larry Cedar, you know, from Deadwood yeah. as the creature on the wing of the airplane in this one, yeah, that was terrifying. He was terrifying. And yet George Miller diffuses the terror with comedy. He, he with Larry's great instincts too, I'm sure, uh, did the whole thing with shaking the finger, the That's monster right. shaking yeah. the finger, eating the, the gun and all. It was just delightful. And then there's, if you freeze frame at that moment when uh, John, beautiful work John did in that, uh, lifts the, the shade and the monster is right there, there's one frame of John's eyes popping out of his head. Yeah, so go back and look for that. Wait, that was done it was as like a special effect, just a frame insert? Yes, and I, I remember being very frustrated uh, about that in particular because that was the one day I was able to get John to commit to having lunch with me at the commissary. And uh, he was called back to, to shoot that special effect. And uh, how about Saved by the Bell? How about it? <laughs> Boy, I was ready to punch Casey Kasem. Why? Oh, what boy. happened? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the, the The episode is called Rockumentary, and it, I think it was written in haste to – well, I don't know if it was to do this or not. Elizabeth uh, uh, Berkeley. Berkeley had broken her leg in a skiing accident, and they had this episode where the, the kids all get together. It's a fantasy episode where it's obviously after high school, and they get a band together and become a big – sensation and they all go their ways because how success affects them and all so on and so forth. And Elizabeth couldn't be in it because she had a broken leg. And uh, so I, I came in, uh, was asked to be uh, the guru for Screech, uh, the high geek. So I had, pre I was prepared. I had buck teeth. I already, already had my hair worn as a fright wig when I was playing Stan Laurel at Universal and elsewhere. I knew things that were funny and nerdy. So I came in and kind of blew him away with my thick glasses and pocket protector and all that and uh, and shot this thing. Now, I had this reveal when I my character gives Screech the magical retainer to um, have his wishes come true. Uh, I had this reveal that the retainer came out of this fez that I was wearing on my head to uh, hide my fright wig that I was wearing, or my hair and standing straight up. And Casey Kasem, as uh, you may know, uh, is Muslim. And he thought my wearing of the fez was offensive to the religion. And I was just doing it as a burlesque gag uh, to reveal the, the – to get an extra laugh. I was building the laugh. And he made the producers force me to not use the fez. I was like, well, there goes my reveal. <laughs> well, and the retainer then came out of the spittoon or whatever it was. <laughs> well, the great religious versus comedy war continues on. Yes. Thank you, Casey. <laughs> Well, where can people find you today? Uh, I'm here at my place. Come on over. Okay. <laughs> we're, uh, we're hopping on a bus. No, I'm, I'm currently performing in a very uh, compelling, interesting, immersive show in San Francisco that takes place in a 1923 speakeasy. And you can look it up at the, uh, the speakeasysf.com. Uh, this, this show is – it's immersive theater where – you follow a character that you're, you're interested in and you see their f story unfold. And uh, I also am in rehearsal for a, a stage adaptation of Fisher King playing the Robin Williams role. And we're doing this as a fundraiser for Robin's charities, for the homeless, maybe Parkinson's, since I've, I'm very active in uh, fundraising for Parkinson's when I can afford to. Uh, and, and, you know, I do these uh, little reunions. I have a, a Back to the Future 2 cast reunion where at least four of us are doing the new New Jersey Horror Con and Film Festival at the end of March, beginning of April. Well, Jeffrey, thank you so much for talking to me today about your work. I appreciate it. Matt, thank you for having me on the show. I uh, look forward to maybe revisiting. Thanks again, Jeffrey. All right, be well. Hello, listener. If flipping, folding, and fluffing your pillow throughout the night is getting in the way of you getting a good night's sleep, I have a solution for you. Hello, pillow, kitty. Hello, kitty. This isn't about a cat, though most of my life is. This is about a pillow. The Hullo Pillow, H-U-L-L-O, made with quality materials including a pre-shrunken case, a durable hidden zipper, and a unique buckwheat hull fill that conforms perfectly to the shape of your body. 
Hollow Pillow keeps your spine straight and your neck and back muscles relaxed so that you stay comfortable all night long. I was using a Hollow Pillow until my lady and resident pillow thief took it from me. That's how desirable this thing is. You can even adjust the pillow to your personal preference by adding or removing holes from the zippered opening. And best of all, Hollow has no chemical-based foams or bird feathers and is made from 100% unbleached certified organic cotton, so it's completely environmentally friendly. So go to hollowpillow.com slash I-W-T-T, H-U-L-L-O pillow.com slash I-W-T-T, and purchase your first Hollow Pillow today. Shipping is fast and completely free. Plus, 1% of all profits are donated to the Nature Conservancy. And extra, extra, you, the listener, can save up to $20 on each additional Hollow Pillow purchased. Go to hollowpillow.com slash I-W-T-T to get started sleeping now. Hollow Pillow. Nap time for crap rhyme is what that was. Pillows. Welcome back. My thanks once again to Jeffrey Wiseman and also to Jason Clam, who is now a two-time guest getter for me. I think, is that a record? I don't know. There's probably someone out there that's done that, but I don't think I've had three. Who will it be? Which is a reminder that if you can connect me to a guest, you can come and sit in on that interview if you'd like. Email me at IWasThere2Pod at gmail.com. That's the only way to ensure I'll get it. Twitter or Facebook won't work. Give me an email there if you can connect me to someone you think would be a good guest for this show. All right, up next, Ben Acker, Ben Blacker, writers responsible for the Thrilling Adventure Hour, many popular comic books, and now the new Star Wars novel, Join the Resistance. And the reason we're going to talk about this is a sort of, I was there too on what it's like to work with the Lucasfilm Story Group, and also for myself a little bit of what it's like to be part of the Star Wars canon. That's right. I have questions for me as well. Let's see if they get answered. Well, I'm sitting here with two Bens for the price of one. Ben Acker, Ben Blacker. You know them from the Thrilling Adventure Hour, from various comic books. But what we're really here to talk about is something near and dear to my heart in so many ways. Their new novel, Star Wars, Join the Resistance. Ladies and gentlemen, Ben Acker, Ben Blacker. Hi, guys. Hi, Matt. That's Ben Acker. Hi, Matt. That's Ben Acker, too. What? No, that's Ben Blacker. Hi. Hi. Thank you for having us. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for letting Thanks. us be on what is probably our favorite podcast. The premier podcast of our hearts. Oh, come really? on. Well, let's just cut to the shit, because I've mentioned <laughs> this on this podcast before, yeah. that you guys canonized me <laughs> and Amanda in the Star Wars universe by naming a little marketplace on a planet, Gorley Lund. Yes. I can't tell Lund you. Lund Lund Gorley. Oh, forget it. This well, there's a, story, right. there's a story Lund behind that. I haven't gotten it to it yet because you just gave me the book and <laughs> I've been watching eight Back to the Future movies <laughs> for, for my All other eight. interview. Yeah. <laughs> but So I'm so excited to hear about that, I the hope, book. I hope we get to write those Back to the Future spinoff books. Oh, God. <laughs> Lund Gorley, you don't know. That's one of the nicest things anyone's ever done for me. Including my immediate family. Oh, well, I'm sorry. Thinks, right? Well, they don't have the power to do this kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> we we knew you would get a kick out of it. You, there are a couple of people that are such huge Star Wars fans, and also want to be there too. Mm-hmm. Oh, if I may. Yes. Uh, that sure. that we, there was no question we had to sneak your names in there somewhere, and also. You guys have great, weird Star yeah, Wars Yeah, real names. Star wars names. They do. What, what made you put Amanda in there? Because she's not a Star Wars fan. Uh, the How come it's just not? Oh, yeah. Damn it. <laughs> it's true. Uh, no, what Gourley happened just was, doesn't sound... It was Moz Gourley. Mm-hmm. M-O-S. Like, oh, yeah. like Mos Espa and Mos Eisley. Yes. Uh-huh. Mos Gourley. Oh. For drafts. Yeah. And then uh, we got the note that that was planet-specific. Yeah. Tatooine-based. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Which I had no idea. I and I feel I felt like I it was Mos something on the other planets, but... They would know better than we. I mean, story group, the Star Wars story group knows that stuff. That's their job. That's who they. Um, that's their whole. So yeah, reason they for came being. back to us and were like, "If you can affix some other word to the start of it instead of." Is us. there ever any kind of tone when they come back to you with that, like, uh, "Hello"? <laughs> the, the whole like, if you're uh, writing a Star no, Wars novel, fact, we shouldn't have to tell you this. They, uh, they, I think, try very hard not to have that tone. Yeah, when oh, we that's met nice. them in person. And I, uh, I used the non, the non word, and Jedi's, to pluralize, uh, the non word Jedi. Right, like uh, deer. Right. Yeah, that exactly. they yeah. they went out of their way to politely work in the correction, 
into the conversation without as opposed correcting to like, you directly. <laughs> <laughs> it's je- the, pl- the plural of Jedi is Jedi. Uh, everyone knows that. A monkey knows that. But there is um, – so so Ben is right. Like they, they do Thank you. try to not have that tone, but they really are internet nerds. Yeah. The, I don't know if people are familiar with Story Group, but they are these – like they were internet dwellers who were tracking well, one all the was. Star Wars – a couple of them were – who were tracking all the Star Wars stuff. And then at a certain point, Lucasfilm kept going back to them and checking their website. So they just hired them. Uh, and now they officially keep the canon of Star Wars, oh, which crosses. I wish we could get this fact check. <laughs> but can you imagine the they day see, that two they of them approached seem like them? cool guys. But imagine the day that they were approached. Oh, and yeah. And went like, what? This thing I've been doing on the side is going to be official? Their heads probably exploded. I think, yeah. Well, Maybe. it is. I mean, it's. It, I feel like that's like any of us who are now getting to play with these Star Wars toys is like we we had the same reaction when we were approached to do the book. Yeah. Ben literally <laughs> said to the editor, "Do we have to pretend to go away and talk to each other about this before we agree to do it? <laughs> because we want to do it." How were you approached? Uh, the editor uh, Michael Siglane worked in the uh, worked as an editor at Batman at DC at the Batman office years ago, and so he knew. Uh, our friend Greg Rucka, who wrote Batman for him, uh, who had our contact information, was writing a Star Wars book uh, for them. And so uh, they had talked internally about this notion for a Star Wars book, and they had used as, as context for the tone uh, Sparks Nevada, Marshall on Mars for, from our thrilling adventure hour. Ah. And so when they said, and who should we get to write it? They were like, well, Why, what about those guys? <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, uh, they, I mean, it really, it feels like and we've seen this, I feel like, from everyone who's working on Star Wars things, mm-hmm. that everyone is so excited to be there. Mm. And so they have such good attitudes from, like, Mike is the sort of group editor to our editor, Jen Heddle, to, like, the, the artists and the story group. And then people we know who are working on the movies and video games and stuff. Like, everyone's – we Not grew up with it, so we're just so excited to be – part of it now and how Not much that there's a conversation around it nobody's talking no. ndas are binding absolutely <laughs> how much of this do they come to you with an outline or is it just whatever you want they came to us with a broad notion they came mm-hmm. to us with like uh kids who want to fly the x-wings and are not able to like they're too immature they're yeah. not um they're not there yet uh, and they gave us, you know, broad like stuff for taps books. for Star Wars. <laughs> well, it kind of was. I oh, mean, it really? Was a bunch of kids joined the resistance. Think Goonies or Harry Potter in space okay, yeah. was kind of what they pitched us, and All then right. let us create the characters and create the story. Goonies makes more sense than Taps, I think. Yeah, <laughs> you mean <laughs> as a movie? Yeah. Well, the fun of Taps <laughs> in my young adult <laughs> novel. We, there was a school tie. I'd like draft. to see it. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to see it. So. How long did you guys work on it? You had to have a pretty quick turnaround on this. Am I right about that? It was. We talked about it for so long. Yeah, it's a, a th- casually it's or a, like meetings where you'd sit down and go like, okay, both. We had break we, the story. We officially got started theoretically <laughs> a month before Force Awakens comes out, and I can tell you that for sure because a month before we mm-hmm. went up to Lucas Studio and were shown the PowerPoint presentation version. Of, of Force, Force Awakens. Awakens. Yeah. And what oh, was which your... Which was so exciting. So, so what was your initial feeling of that, just seeing a PowerPoint presentation? It was cr- like, I was more excited for the movie having seen yeah. the presentation. I thought you said I was more excited for the, for the PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> oh, it was a great PowerPoint wait till you, Wait till this comes out in Microsoft <laughs> Office. Until you've seen storyboards of The Force Awakens, you haven't really experienced <laughs> the movie. They didn't spoil thing, as much stuff as you would think they would yeah. have to to, yeah. to give us an idea of the story. Uh-huh. The, the last third of the movie, they said, and then there's a Star War. Okay. So <laughs> yeah. you don't need to know what happens yeah. there. It doesn't affect the books. Okay. So And then we had... Uh, and then, yeah, it took a while for contracts. And I think that in the book world, it's different from the Hollywood world where we don't start a thing until the contract is signed. Right. Yeah. Because it could all go away. Right. Uh, and so we signed the contracts and they were like, all right, so can we get the manuscript in like what, a week or two? <sighs> yeah, yeah, that was the notes we made. <laughs> uh, and the, and it, everybody was totally understanding about everything. Like it's great place to work. And um, it was. Uh, no, we're we're starting it, <laughs> and and it's I mean, our you first. You can have a stack of papers if you want. Sure, there will be nothing oh, you can on get it. A manuscript, yeah. like we could probably get one of those, but not this one. And this was in like May, May of 2015, 16. 2016. Mm-hmm. And yes. so, are these all? And then we had about a month to write it. Original characters, or did they 
give you any that you had to include? All the leads are original characters. There are cameos from some Star Wars favorites, uh, which were really fun to write. <sighs> Any, anyone you can tell us about? Because yeah. I will be reading this. Well, they do. Uh, I mean, the kids, most of the book takes place on the Resistance base, or at least half of it takes place on the Resistance the, base that oh, we see in, in Force Awakens. Awakens. Okay. Yeah. So they, <laughs> General Leia is not in it, but her office is. <laughs> mm-hmm. Is this the one on Yavin 4? Is it that uh, we can't say we can't. What? Uh, we can't divulge the location of the resistance base. Oh, I don't care how much damn, you torture you us. Almost <laughs> fell. Damn, I'm a first order guy from way back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, 30 years ago, it didn't exist before that. But, <laughs> um, the ties are interesting. We actually had to do a deep dive into the empire and the sort of that 30 year gap because they have filled a lot of it in with some of the novels and some of the comics. And so we had to sort of look at that stuff and, and figure out who was where and who was doing what and what really what people would know because our book takes place right before Force Awakens. Uh-huh. So what would a 15-year-old kid know about what had come 30 years before, 40 years before? Right. I don't know. It was, it was neat and some of that history is in – that's the fun of Star Wars is there's this world, there's this history to explore. But for, for existing characters, uh, we got to write Admiral Akbar, which was super fun. Yeah. <laughs> it's such an easy voice mm-hmm. to write. I mean, he has so little dialogue in the movies, but they're, <laughs> it's memorable dialogue. Look, he'd be great for this show. Oh, he just died. <laughs> he did, he? Yeah. yeah. I thought about him, but yeah, he's he even been. in Force Awakens, he does the voice for Akbar, and you can tell, yeah. well, that's an older Akbar there. <laughs> that's... <laughs> Yeah, um, we did try to do an older Akbar in the book. Really, walking <laughs> well, sure. stick. Yeah, he's. I mean, it's thirty years later. Skin's a little dried out. <laughs> Ew. Uh, Ew. <laughs> well, tell me more about Lund Gorley. Let's. Uh, <laughs> what can you tell us about this marketplace? Is it a rogues gallery? Is it a uh, high, high end? It's a real jerk store. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're talking Ross Dress for less or Nordstrom Rack or Saks Fifth Avenue. Here. Ooh, definitely Ross. Do they sell Ivanka shoes at this place? So no, definitely no, not. Okay. That, you think that survives? That's empire shit. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, it's the city center on the planet of Dirk Teal. Right. Are you familiar with this planet? Yeah, you didn't make it up. I thought you made it I up. I didn't. Yeah, yeah, we talked about this. Is this where um, the Bosques are from? I, I thought it was where the Boston is. From. Is that right? But it was. <laughs> you can't say that anymore. Can't, don't give us any super ego nonsense. <laughs> no, that's real. I think Boss is a Trandoshans. That's some Shans. Fletch. Now I got to look that up because I'm going to catch hell if it's not. But keep, <laughs> from keep talking. From every. They're out there. They, yeah. they, yeah. they live. <laughs> All right. Um, I do know is, that name. Dirk Teal is the home to. They're sort of lizard people. There is a. Lizard story no, Trandosha. Yeah. That so sense. that was my initial idea. And then there was something I couldn't do with that planet. Like it didn't quite fit into what we needed. Okay. So the reason we went with Dirk Teal is I like the look of the lizard people who live there. And there's one guy in Star Wars, in Moss Eisley, I think, in the Cantina scene. <gasps> oh, I know what you're talking about. The Snaggletooth guy. Yes. Yes. That's right. Okay. Yes. His name is Snaggletooth, yeah. which was only named from the action figure. Right. Because, yes, and there, there were two versions of that action figure, one that's tall, right. one short, and one's real rare. I'll that's take right your word now. for it. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's right. That character, <laughs> Snaggletooth, is not in the later editions of the movie, I didn't realize. They I think he's out? been digitally removed and replaced with something else. That of all the ones to get rid of? I know. But oh. uh, I read that just recently. Um so those are the beings who live on Dirk Teal, and they're, our lead character, Mattis, is from uh, an orphanage there, and they get bussed into the city center, Lund Gorley, to go to church and to do shopping. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> yes, to sell the Hemel that they harvest. Is the Hemel a thing you made up? I don't remember. It might be a thing, a Star Wars thing, but I might have made it up. I'm so looking forward to, ge- to reading this. How, how much time is spent in Dirk Teal, would you say? I mean, and in Lund Gorley. I think the first chapter. Yeah, at least the oh, first God, chapter. God, I could have gotten that done couple. last night. I, I wish I would have known. I thought for sure it would be like right in the meat of it, you know? <laughs> oh, no, in the meat of it is, is a, a, a friend of ours who likes Star Wars much more than yeah, you. Yeah, Dan Telfer? Tony Thaxton. Tony Thaxton. Tony, uh, I don't, for people who don't know, Tony Thaxton is a musician with, uh, I want to say Queens of the Stone Age. No, no. Uh, no? Am I uh, wrong? The, the <laughs> Village Green the Preservation Richard. Society. That may be right. Is the band. <laughs> uh, Motion City Soundtrack is Tony's band, and uh, Tony is as big a Star Wars fan as you. He may, 
he well, yeah. I, I wonder. He may be bigger in his collector sense. Like he has <laughs> yeah, a million there are toys. A lot of my I don't have. I have my old toys. I don't have new toys. Yeah. Though I do have something new that we'll talk about in a minute oh. at the show that we're, oh, yes. we're doing. Yeah. Uh, but Tony texted last night. Ben named a bird after Tony. A bird in uh, on the planet of Vodron. Uh-huh. Which is Tony the most, Toucan? The story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a real Fruit Loops side story. <laughs> what is the name of the bird? <laughs> the Darth Exton. Oh, that's good. Thanks. Who else do we know that you guys have worked in? Uh, well, our friend Todd. We <laughs> Todd Cooper. Todd Cooper, a uh, friend of every podcast. And friend of everybody that, that meets him. America's yes. plus one, Todd Cooper. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is this, he say that or you say he, that? He we did, both said that. He yeah, used to introduce good. himself that way. <laughs> that's pretty good. Um we saved uh, Todd's mention for a horrific, just disgusting creature that attacks the kids uh, towards the end of the book. It is literally called a Todd. T-A-W-D. <laughs> that's good. God. Oh. Uh, Mike Furman's name oh, that's is, right. is, is in there. We what made him he? into a religion. The uh, church they go to at Dirk Teal is, the, is firmest. Yeah. How do you spell that? With a P-H. P-H, but then est? I, uh, IST. I, okay. Oh, firmest. Yeah. Yeah, and I we see. wanted it, it was interesting also. Look, guys, if you love Star Wars, get, get yourself to Wikipedia yeah. and poke around because there are these various shades of religious orders right. there. And and we even saw some in Rogue One, which I thought was yeah. really neat. But like to take what they had existing and sort of extrapolate, like, well, this isn't a force based religion, yeah. but how do we create a religion in Star Wars that won't get in the way of the stuff they do? Uh, like that was a constant question with how do we create something where it can sort of exist in this book and serve the needs of this plot or these characters without, you know, Con- contradicting. Yeah. Something. Without yeah. contradicting or having to be brought up later in any other of the media that they do. While you're on Wikipedia poking around on their listeners, make sure to, to get Longorly firmly established on there. This, this has to happen. I wonder if it is. We'll have to check. It'll be on Wikipedia at some point. It has to be, right? <laughs> Let's check. Because all that <laughs> stuff winds up on there, especially if it's, if it's revisited, which um, at least the name will be. You guys interview yourself. I'm going to check this. Ben. Once. Yeah. What is it, Ben? Um, what was your favorite Star Wars action figure? Probably Boba Fett. Is that <sighs> right? No, Hammerhead. Oh, Hammerhead. loved Hammerhead. It was more textural, I think. Well, guys, Long yeah. Gorley's not on Wicked. Well, Wikipedia. not yet. No. The book's not out yet. It comes out March 8th, and you yeah. can pre order it from Amazon. March right the now. 8th be with you, everyone. That's yeah. right. Star and Wars Day. <laughs> let's talk. <laughs> Star Wars Day plus four. Yeah, March 4th. No, wait. 4th. No, minus a bunch. <laughs> let's talk about March 8th, because that's a significant day where you're doing a bit of a book release party and show, right? We are. It's a benefit for public counsel. Uh, which is, you know, our book is called Star Wars Join the Resistance, and it now seems like a better time than ever to do something Resistance-themed. I did Jimmy Pardo's podcast yesterday, and they had to join the Resistance pins there. Yeah. And they gave me one, and I wore it doubly proud for for the sake of this novel and for the Wait, sake our of novel our has damn country. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I had one. Yeah, the timing, yeah. the timing on this book and its title is fortuitous. I would prefer that it weren't. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us about this show and that people should come. People should come. Uh, the show is March 8th at Largo at the Cornet here in Los Angeles. Uh, it is a Star Wars themed benefit slash book release party. So people can get books there and we'll, we'll sign them and stuff. The element of the show with which I'm involved yes. is, is not easy for me to contend with. Should what? we talk about this? I or guess I mean, there's no reason to it. keep it a surprise. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, there are two elements really that I'm not comfortable with. <laughs> a lot of nudity. <laughs> I would have a better time with that. Uh, well, and let's squids. talk about the main thing. Yeah, let's talk about the, the song that we haven't heard yet. No, thank God. Well, oh God. <laughs> when I was in college, I even want to say grad school. I think I was in grad school. I wrote a song called Stormtroopers Are People Too. This is Wait. I thought you were a child no. when you did that. No. <laughs> I was well into my 20s. Oh, no. This is fantastic. And it's this all, is better than I imagined. It's one of the first songs I ever wrote. And I, I went on to like love music and do a fair amount of songwriting, and for better or for worse. But this was the first one. And it's horrible. <laughs> it's just horrible. 
And I got my first four track recorder and I recorded my roommate at the time was a really good guitarist. So there, there are some, oh some <laughs> silver linings in it, <laughs> but the melody is, <laughs> it's so repetitive and the, the lyrics are bad, but this was before the prequels. So nobody knew stormtroopers were clones. So I had this whole theory that sure. like, these are people too. We should care about them. <laughs> and I drew a drawing of a stormtrooper holding a smelling a daisy <laughs> and this song which you should really you should put that up on the website yeah here. it's pretty fantastic the song <laughs> got on dr demento and kiss fm and it was proof that all you had to do is write something like one of the early signs is like just write something about nerd and popular culture it doesn't matter how good it is people will eat it up and it taught me an important lesson like just because you can doesn't mean you should <laughs> it was like the n nuclear weapons test of of pop culture and to this day I, I have a little like nervous tick in me that doesn't allow me to capitalize on just whatever is popular at the time, mm -hmm. you know, which it makes a lot of sense as I do this podcast on <laughs> Star Wars movies. But you know what I mean? <laughs> no, there's nothing I mean, contemporary I, on I this podcast. A, yeah, I have a rough relationship with memes is what I say. <laughs> <laughs> it said the same about you. So we're going to do something with that. We're going to do something with this song. Hopefully um, we're going to have you perform it. Oh. The, the crazy thing is, so Matt told me about this maybe a month ago, and I was like, we have to do this for the show. And then you emailed me and we're like, do you have a cassette player? <laughs> I only have this on cassette. No, and I don't have a cassette player, so we had to hunt down a cassette player. We're going to give it a listen and see if we can do something with it. Yeah. Um, but I and think then it'll, it'll be, be Star Wars canon. Yeah, that's right. Because everything, everything that they happens, do now is <laughs> canon. That's right. What? Everything that happens in our show. Uh -huh. Oh, God. You don't want this in the canon. I can't, I can't allow this to be canon. Like, I have to protect canon. No, it's the be... story group is checking, fact-checking everything in the show. Oh. It's going to be well, the it's, new uh, I mean, it, it holds up. Fact check wise, <laughs> you can at least depend on okay. that. Yeah, uh, okay. uh, but that'll be fun. So look forward to that. Go to largo-la.com to get tickets. And as we said, it's a benefit for public counsel who um, provides free legal counsel to underserved communities uh, in Los Angeles. Well, that they, makes they me feel really a lot better. I had no idea that that was part of it. Until it's it's now, for so. a good cause. Okay, I'll do it. It really is. All right, because <laughs> it's it's shaping up to be a really cool line. I'm at best. Yes, I saw that too. Yeah, and follow ben, the Bens or me, and you'll get this information in yeah. your timeline at some um, point. Ahmed should come do this show. I would love to have him. That would be show. fun. He's yeah. a great guy. I would especially we'll love we'll to have him. him. He played Jar Jar Binks in the uh, prequel movies in Serpico, and <laughs> is a lovely guy. And, uh, it took me out of it. <laughs> it put me in it. <laughs> we saw <sit> undercover. <laughs> Anything else you guys need to tell us about this book, other than I think people should just eat this up go get it go enjoy it it looks like a pretty quick read it is i mean yeah. look it's a it's a young adult book uh but oh we... it's a they call it a middle grade book uh which is a technical term and not an insult you mean like <laughs> for middle grades yeah like yeah. like junior high yeah oh, like seventh eighth okay, grade great. god eighth, i would have eaten grade. this up at the time it is if you uh read the first harry potter it is that uh, grade book, uh, that type of reading. But, you know, look, we wrote it for our middle grade selves. Mm -hmm. We had a great time doing it. And why don't just, you, yeah, why don't you read the first chapter? I just right saw now. my name in here. <laughs> oh my God. I got a, I got a shiver. <laughs> here it is. I'm just going to read you a small excerpt. Is sure. that okay? Yeah. Mattis had been ready for an adventure for as long as he could remember. From the first time he heard the stories about the scrappy and courageous rebellion overthrowing the dark and giant empire, Mattis knew his place in the universe was as a galactic champion like Luke Skywalker or Leia Organa or even Admiral Akbar, who will appear later in this novel. Those names <laughs> loomed large meta. for Mattis, even if they, as if they'd been carved into a 50-meter tall stone tablet, hearing their stories along with the older kids at the orphan farm in Lund Gorley as they tilled the hemel fields or drift shuttled to the firmest temples stirring something in Mattis. Wow. We're in the same sentence as Mike Carm. <laughs> this is great. Yeah, you've arrived. This is great. You want to own a piece of history? Pick up this book. <laughs> ben Acker, Ben Blacker, thank you guys for talking about this. With Thanks me. for having us, Matt. Thank you, the Bens. And it's true, there will be a live book release party March 8th at Largo. And I will be doing something with this song. And the worst part of it is that one of the guests just announced is, in fact, Weird Al Yankovic. So he'll be performing one of his legitimate Star Wars songs. And I'll be doing this in the same show w with the understanding that, thank God, he's 
the nicest man in the world, is there to witness this abomination that I have written. I, I do have a, like a palpable amount of dread for this because it's like meeting someone you really respect and then putting your worst foot forward. <laughs> so you don't want to miss this? I do. March 8th at Largo. Thank you for listening. You can find out more about this show on Twitter at I was there to pod at Matt Gorley and on Instagram at Matt Gorley and letterboxed at Matt Gorley. Until next time, see you next time. Hey, this is Jason Sklar, one of the hosts of Sklar Bro Country, a podcast here on Earwolf that we love doing. And we have a fantastic episode where we sit down with the hilarious Caitlin Olson. We talk to her about her comedic process. We talk to her about some inside the actor studio, behind the scenes. It's always sunny in Philadelphia stuff. Here's a clip. Do your, are your kids in karate? Ours are in jujitsu. Does Rob take the classes with your kids? He would love to. <laughs> he, would love to. He, he takes jujitsu, like adult jujitsu. <laughs> but like for the first four or five times, he brought his gi and everything in a bag. I'm like, what do you expect's going to happen in there? We had a blast. I think you'll enjoy it. And uh, you can check it out on earwolf.com, iTunes, or your favorite podcast app. Sklarbro Country. Get into it. This has been an Earwolf production. Executive produced by Scott Ackerman, Chris Bannon, and Colin Anderson. For more information and content, visit Earwolf.com. Earwolf.